This is Dr. Lauren Lownan, and this is a video lecture about mutations and DNA repair. We're going to be defining the term mutation and also mutation rate. And I want you to realize that mutations can be described in many different ways and think about some of those ways. And we're going to then talk about DNA repair systems, focusing kind of on the bigger picture of DNA repair systems, as well as looking at a couple of the details of the variety of DNA repair systems that we have. A mutation means an alteration in DNA sequence that persists through cell division. In other words, it is not repaired. So in order to have a mutation, you have to have two things happen. Something has to change in the DNA, and then that change needs to persist through cell division and become fixed, therefore, in that cell lineage. This could be any base pair change or any deletion or insertion of DNA, or even a major alteration in the structure of a chromosome, like a translocation event. When considering mutations, the cellular, muta the cellular location of mutations is important. So you can describe mutations as being somatic or germline. A somatic mutation means a mutation that, ha that happens in a cell that is part of the non-germline or somatic tissue. So this could be a mutation in a skin epithelial cell or in a breast cell. And then that could be problematic for the health of the individual, but it's not something that that individual would pass on to their offspring. Germline mutations, however, are mutations in the cells that are going to undergo meiosis. And therefore, mutations that happen in those cells, and those cells are called myocytes, those cells can then produce eggs or sperm, and the mutation will be carried within the genome in the egg or the sperm, and therefore inherited by the offspring. And that's what this figure is showing here. So there was a mutation that affected egg or sperm, maybe in the myocyte or maybe in the egg or the sperm itself as it was differentiating, and that therefore then is a heritable mutation that this child would have in every single cell of their body. Mutation rate is a term that means the rate at which mutations take place at a given locus or within a population. So it's how frequently a mutation happens, either within a sequence, which is a locus, or within a population. And generally, um, there will be some sort of agreed upon way of normalizing rate, like for example, per 100,000 people in a population or per um, genome size. So here's a problem to help make sure that you understand the concept of mutation rate. Let's consider a rare dominant mutation expressed in humans. So if you've got big A, you've got this condition. If you're little a, little a, you do not. Let's say that for every 40,000 live births, so babies that are born alive, there are six cases in a particular population. But let's say that two of those were from parents who also had the mutation. And then we ask the question, what is the mutation rate for this particular mutation or gene in the population? And we remember to take into account that for every new human birth, that individual that was formed is formed as the result of the fusion of two gametes. So that looks like a lot of information, right? A really wordy word problem. And it's repeated here. But let's sort of break this apart into its bits and pieces. If we discount the two cases from parents who had the mutation, why do we discount them? Because that does not represent new mutations, right? They were existing mutations. The individuals have them because the parent had the mutation. So if we discount that, then that takes us from six cases down to four, right? Six minus two is four. And then we say, all right, here's the size of the population, 40,000 under consideration. So four out of 40,000. It's tempting to say that that's the rate. But this problem says that it's a rare mutation, right? And for each of these 40,000 individuals, two gametes had to come together. So if we, if we focus on that rare piece, we could say, all right, if it's rare, let's assume that those cases are, are individuals that have one big A only. So they're probably heterozygous, because if it's rare, it's unlikely that it's going to happen 
twice. It's less likely that it'll happen twice than just one time. So then we say, all right, we take that number four and we divide by two. And so the mutation rate then would be two out of 40,000 and we can simplify that to one out of 20,000. And that is the mutation rate per 20,000 live births in that population. Mutations rates will vary within the genomes of different organisms and also at different locations within the organism. So it's not true. It is true that mutations are random events, but they do happen more frequently in some organisms than others. And even within those organisms, they will happen more frequently at certain locations than other locations in the genome. So there can be what are called hotspots for mutation events within an organismal genome. This figure is looking at mutation rate in a variety of groups of organisms. So viroids, which are tiny vi viral particles like prions, RNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, double-stranded DNA viruses, bacteria, and then different types of eukaryotes. And here they've kind of falsely used the term lower and higher. Here they're meaning like microbial eukaryotes and then multicellular eukaryotes. And as genome size gets bigger and bigger and bigger, in general, mutation rate gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So when you have really tiny genomes, you tend to have a higher mutation rate. When you have really big genomes, you tend to have a lower mutation rate. That's something we can derive from this figure. Mutations can be categorized in a variety of ways. So for example, they can be spontaneous or they can be induced. Induced means brought on by something in the environment. Spontaneous means happens just as a result of normally occurring cellular processes. We can also categorize mutations according to where they happen in the genome, the type of molecular change, and the phenotypic effect. And within like just one single mutation event, we can describe it using all these different considerations as well. So there's a lot of overlap in these ways of thinking about mutations. Let's go ahead and consider um, some of these. First, focusing in on categorizing mutations by molecular change. So for example, if we're using the cat saw the dog as a proxy or substitute for a DNA sequence, right? We could have substitutions, deletions, or insertions as different categories of molecular change. Substitution means you take one nucleotide and swap it out for another. A deletion means you remove one or more nucleotides. And an insertion means that you add one or more uh, nucleotides. A substitution is generally or often called a point mutation. Insertions and deletions both call, cause what are called frame shift mutations, right? Because they will knock a coding sequence out of frame, change the nature of the codons. And within molecular change, there's a lot more detail that we can drill into. So you can have point uh, mutations that are what are called base substitutions, and they can be missense mutations where you alter the codon so that you get a different amino acid after the mutation event. They can be nonsense mutations where you change a functional amino acid coding codon to the stop or terminus codon. They can be silent mutations where the codon's changed. Um, but the amino acid is the same. They could be transitions where we swap a purine for a purine or a pyrimidine for a pyrimidine. So we don't think about the effect on the codon. We just think about the nucleotides themselves. A transversion means a purine for a pyrimidine or a pyrimidine for a purine. And then frame shifts, as I said earlier, means you've added or removed one or two or a unit of one or two nucleotides so that you have altered the reading frame from the point of the mutation onwards. When we're talking about mutations, we also describe their phenotypic effects. So here's a photo of a yellow Drosophila melanogaster, or fruit fly. Normally they're kind of a muddy brown grayish color, but this one is this kind of very golden yellow color across its full body. And so it's phenotypically different from the standard wild type that we see, certainly in natural populations. 
and that is a, a result of having a mutation in one particular gene. So the phenotype means the colors changed. Um, and there are also behavioral effects to having this mutation. So for example, these yellow fruit flies do not mate as frequently as the, as the wild type. So mutations can have phenotypic effects that are behavioral or morphological, like changing the color, or perhaps biochemical, like maybe there's a difference in the neurotransmitter levels you know, in the brains of these particular flies. And sometimes they'll have multiple phenotypic effects. Here are two mice, and on the left we see a mouse that's kind of the more typical grayish brown color, and on the right this kind of yellowy mouse is because this particular mouse has one um, allele for a gene that's called the agouti gene, and they have the yellow allele for that gene. And if you're heterozygous for that gene, for that particular allele in your mouse, you'll have this coloring. Um, and these guys over here are going to be little a, little a, so they lack the, you know, yellow associated allele. And um, you will actually never see um, mice that are the AY, AY homozygote because this is a lethal mutation such that um, it's not tolerated when it's the only form of the gene present. And um, the phenotypic effect, I think it's pretty easy to see that there's a color effect, but um, if you look really closely, and it's a little hard to see from this picture, you might notice that this mouse is a little more rotund than this mouse. And in fact, these um, agouti phenotype mice tend to be very chubby. Even if you don't feed them a lot, they get really chubby, and so they get higher um, rates of cancer and um, cardiovascular disease um, from having that extra weight. So this is a, a gene that is what is called pleiotrophic. It has many effects on the organism, and we really see that when we study mice that carry the agouti gene. So I'm going to uh, break this up, and the next portion of this video lecture will address how mutations occur.